Good afternoon. My name is Ken Hartzell. I am a livestock risk management specialist for Badgerland Financial. And welcome to the 2011 uh, World Dairy Expo, where today's seminar is LGM Dairy for uh, Livestock Gross Margin for Dairy Insurance. Our speaker today, let's try this. Our speaker today is Dr. Chad Hart, an assistant professor from in the Department of Economics from Iowa State University. The, um, he's also a member of a, a partner in Farm Risk, an Iowa firm that develops revenue insurance products, including livestock gross margin. This seminar has been approved for continuing education credits from the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists and from the American Association of Veterinary State Boards, the RACE program. And there will be some forms in the back of the room that you can fill out if uh, those work for you. At this time, we would, we would ask that you all check and silence your cell phones so that we don't have in interruptions. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Chad Hart. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Ken. All right. Well, as, as Ken mentioned, uh, my name is Chad Hart. Um, I'm one of the creators of LGM. And uh, we basically have three products on the LGM. We do one for dairy, one for beef cattle, and one for swine. They all basically have this very similar features. Um, but what I'm going to walk you through here today is what LGM for dairy is. Um, how it's been changed as we go through time. And I know there was, you know, this is a product that really took off last year. In fact, it took off so much that we used all our federal money up by March. And so this coming month, here in October, will be the first month since then that LGM for Dairy will be available to producers again. And so we're looking to see how it performs as we go forward over time. But first of all, let me tell you what LGM for dairy is. It's, a, it's an insurance product that's run through the federal crop insurance program. And so in this case, the federal government started to allow livestock insurance about a decade ago. And one of the places we decided was an LGM, a gross margin product. That basically a gross margin here in this case is looking at the difference between your milk revenues versus your feed costs and trying to ensure that difference. And so when that margin goes lower, this insurance pays off. We started back in 01 with hogs, because I'm from Iowa. Hogs was a natural starting point. And over time, we've developed, like I say, beef cattle and now dairy. And so, like I say, in this case, it's a dairy insurance program. So it's looking specifically at milk, corn, and soybean meal as you think about what it's covering the, the cost side there. It protects against declines in this gross margin. I've laid it out here, the market value of the milk minus your feed cost. It's very much concentrated on price levels. So if you're looking for a product that covers your milk production, per se, when you come short on your milk, this doesn't do that. This is targeted at those price levels that you see up on the CME board. And it uses the futures markets themselves to help set the guarantees. So another question I often get asked is, where do you get that milk price from? Well, we get it exactly from the same place everybody else does, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We rely on the futures market to tell us what is the proper value of the milk, what's the proper value of the corn, what's the proper value of the soybean meal to build some insurance upon. Now, LGM, what way we set this up is we look at futures prices, say now, and then we'll come back and look at the month you want to insure at, look at those same futures prices, and we look at the differences between the two. And so when I talk about the gross margins now, that's looking at what are the futures markets saying today, we set that up and call that a gross margin guarantee. That's what futures are indicating your milk is worth today, the corn is worth today, the soybean meal is worth today. And then we're going to compare that to your actual gross margin. So let's say you're insuring milk in December. Then we'll look at what that milk is saying it's going to be worth in December today versus when we get to December, what's that milk actually worth? The difference is what this insurance is trying to protect. Like I say, it doesn't insure against death loss of the cattle, doesn't insure against production loss, any damage to the cattle. This is protecting that price margin. 
that you have online. It also doesn't protect against multi-year losses here. This has a set period of coverage here. Typically, I think of it like a year. For example, at the end of this month, LGM for dairy will be available. They'll be buying it in October. They have a, what they call blackout month for November, and then the insurance starts for December. And it will run all the way through until next September, if you wish. So you can buy coverage for about a year's worth, but beyond that, it does not cover that risk either. And when you look here, the idea is it's covering you against unanticipated drops in price. You know, as I say here, it doesn't protect against anticipated declines in price. So let's say the futures market today said milk's worth $16.55, but as I look out the next September, it says $14.50. That's an anticipated drop in milk prices over the next year. That's not covered by LGM. But let's say that September price, when we get out there, falls to $12.50. That is unexpected. That is covered. That difference between $14.50 and $12.50. How LGM works, it's a, um, it's a fairly simple process. But the idea is we depend a lot on price levels and at different points in time. When you're buying LGM insurance, we start off with what we call expected prices. And in this case, I want you to think when you go look at the board at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. When you look out there, it will have prices for November milk, December milk, January milk, all the way out through next September. Those set our expected prices as we look out over the next year. Same way on the corn. You look out there, you see December corn, March corn, May corn. Those are setting the expected prices for corn, same way with the soybean meal. We take those prices, and then we put them through a formula. And part of that formula is based upon what you as a producer enter in. You tell me, how much milk do you want to insure? How much corn do you think you're going to feed? How much soybean meal do you think you're going to use? We take those amounts, take them times these prices, and that helps set the guarantee for the insurance. That guarantee just gets, like I say, calculated off of a, an equation. Then we wait to see what prices actually do. Wait for those months to occur, get the actual prices. Again, looking at those futures contracts. So if you've insured December milk, that's the contract we're looking at. In December, we'll see where December milk settles out at. We plug that into this formula. We use the same formula that you've told us back here for the expecteds to create an actual gross margin. What actually is your margin off your milk price? And then we look back to say, how does that differ from what the expected one was? If it's lower, you're gonna get a payment. If it's higher, great. The markets provide you a better margin than what you expected. And so, this is covering that time when the market moves against you. And in this case, it's not just the milk market. It could be the milk prices go down. That could trigger a payment. It could be the milk prices stay the same, but feed costs go up. That shrinks your margin. That's also insured here. So it's a little more complicated than just a standard put option on milk. But in some ways, it works the same way. Once you know this expected gross margin, the gross margin guarantee, it works like a put on that. When that margin falls below, you're gonna get a payment. Now, like I say, it's available over basically a year time window. This would be the window had you been looking at this last month, what you would have been able to do. So at the end of September, this is available. They have what's called the blackout month. And in this case, this is something that the, the, the federal government wanted in this program because what they wanted was something that was unanticipated. And what they were worried about is if you could insure that next month immediately, eh, you know sort of what's coming up for the next month. So there's a blackout month and then you go into it. And the idea is it's up to the producer which months you would like to insure in. You don't have to insure all 10 months. You can insure in just one or two or five. 
you have the flexibility to choose when you want to put this insurance in place. Anytime during this 10 month window, you can be in here. And then each month we go forward, it's offered again, this window slides forward. So if you think about it, for like say that December 2011 period, you have 10 opportunities to ensure that margin in that time period. Each month, you'll have a new opportunity to do so. Now, like I said earlier, the expected prices, we rely upon the futures market, so they come from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. In this case, the milk price we use is just a class three milk price. Comes straight off the board. As far as the feed costs are concerned, we factor everything back to corn and soybean meal. And I'll talk how we do that in just a minute. But the idea is we needed feed costs that you could validate yourself. And so by using the Chicago Board of Trade corn and soybean meal futures, this is something everybody can look up on their own and see where we're at. As far as setting the expected price, what we end up doing is at the end of each month, basically, we take a three-day average of the settlement prices on the milk, on the corn, on the soybean meal for all the contracts over the next year. And those determine our expected prices. So we're not using any sophisticated model. We're letting the market tell us what's the value of your milk, what's the value of your feed, and that's what we're going to plug in. This is just to show you what you would have been able to ensure if you could have signed up just a few days ago at the end of September. These are the three days where the futures price is out here for the November contract, December contract, and so on. You can see how much volatility we had in those markets over that period of time. And then this average down here is that three-day average. That's what we use to say that's the expected price for your milk. So for example, if you were on an insurer in November, average milk price, 1668. That's what we were going to plug in to this formula for this insurance. As you look further out, you can see that the milk price was sort of declining as we get down into February, starts to kick up again. Again, it's following whatever market pattern is showing up on the futures contracts. We do that with milk. We also do that with the corn. One well, of the big differences, though, is milk, the futures contract, is available each and every month. For corn, that's not the case. There are only five contracts per year for corn. So we have an issue here. We've got one for December. We've got one for March. We can pop off those averages pretty easy. What do we do with the in-between ones? Well, in this case, we fill in the hole by basically saying, you know what, we're going to take these two points that we know here, so this 619 here, that 632, and we're going to use them to help us build an average. And we're just going to fill in the dots that way. So as you can see here from 619, we go from 623, 628, 632, draw the straight line in between the two points. That's how we fill in the missing months. We do that on the way in. So to set the expected guarantees, we do that same thing on the way out when we do the actual prices. And so again, this is reflecting what the market is saying about the cost of your feed at the time you buy the insurance. Do the same thing on the soybean meal, where again, we're looking at the futures where they're available, filling in the gaps based upon the average between the two points in between. Now, as a producer, you have no impact on those price levels. The choices you get to make are, one, what month do you want to insure in, or months you want to insure in. Two, how much milk do you want to have covered in there? Three, how much feed would you like to have covered in there? And then four, like most other types of insurance, you're allowed to pick a deductible. And this deductible works like on your car insurance or on your home insurance. The higher that deductible, the lower the cost of the insurance. So this product, again, very much like a typical insurance product. Here your deductible is based off 100 weights of milk. 10 cent increments, you can have no deductible, meaning you're covering that margin, the full margin of what's available on the markets today, or you can knock it all the way down to two bucks below that. And I like to think of that two bucks, that deductible that way, being like a catastrophic level. If the markets really move against you, then you've got some basic floor in there through this policy. 
So the producer has a lot of flexibility in how you want to use this. For people who produce a lot of their own feed, it would make sense to take that feed mounts that you're putting in here and drop that to the lowest level you possibly can. Because you've already protected yourself by producing your own feed as far as that cost is concerned. On the other hand, if you're worried about feed cost terribly, you can bring in the maximum level. One of the questions I often get asked is, do I have to put in the exact amount of feed that I actually use? And the answer is no. You're able to tailor this product to what you think you need as far as risk management is concerned. There's no one going to come out and check to see that the feed that you're using matches up with what's covered here. In fact, the only thing we're going to check to make sure is, is that you're producing as much milk as you're insuring. Beyond that, you have the flexibility to build this as you want. Now, like I say, for a producer, well, I got a typo there, that should be September 2011. You have the flexibility. When do you want to insure? You could just pick one month, say January. You tell us how many hundredweight of milk, how many tons of corn, how many tons of soybean meal, those go into this calculation. You can do it for one month, you can do it every other month, you can put in different amounts in each month. So again, it's a very flexible setup for producers. You can lay this out for what you feel best fits your financial needs. If you have certain payments that you know are coming up in a certain month and you need to ensure cash flow in that month, you can structure the insurance where it's based on that month. And so, like I say, great deal of flexibility here. Another question I often get is, I don't feed corn and soybean meal. How do I know what to put in? Well, in this case, I'm from Southwest Missouri, not a dairy producer. What we did was we talked to a um, fair number of dairy nutritionists, and it turned out that one of the guys at Iowa State had put together a table, and he basically said, you know, any feed that you put into a dairy ration, you can basically break that down into a feed component and a pro or an energy component and a protein component. And I can take any feed and translate it into corn and soybean meal. And so he gave us this table to help you figure out just how much corn and soybean meal you put in. So if I'm looking at a brewer's grain, 40% dry weight, those are the coefficients I would take times a ton of brewer's grain, and it tells me 1.88 tons, or sorry, 0.188 tons of corn, 0.155, I'm sorry, on the soybean meal, 0.155 on the corn. So no matter what you're feeding, this is a suggested way to make that conversion. And the key is here, it is suggested. When it comes right down to it, again, you can put in almost any feed level that you want. In fact, the only one that's really specifically excluded is you can't put in zero. There has to be at least a little feed in the ration here for the insurance. So again, a lot of flexibility to the producer here. Let me get into, though, building this guarantee and sort of walk you through an example of what LGM can do. And I'm going to base this off of what you could have bought a few days ago. They say gross margin guarantee is basically your milk revenues minus your feed costs. We get the milk revenues, by you put in the amount of milk. We take that times the class of three futures. We say that's your expected milk revenue. You gave us the amount of corn you're going to use, the amount of soybean meal you're going to use. We take those times those two prices. That's your feed costs. So we're just multiplying, adding, and we're going to be subtracting here. For the margin, the expected gross margin, milk revenue minus your feed costs, using these expected prices. And then when you get to your guarantee here, it's just that expected margin minus your deductible. And so again, it's based off looking at this margin and providing a floor under this margin. So let's take what we could have got a couple of days ago. Let's say, you know, I'm in, you know, at the end of September, I want to ensure that first month in November milk. These are the expected prices. Showed you how those were calculated already. Those were the prices, end of September. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to pick a 50 cent deductible. I'm going to ensure 1,500 weight of milk in November. I'm going to feed 20 tons of corn, six tons of meal. That's the information this product needs 
to figure out an insurance for you on this gross margin. Based off what you've told me there, I got my 1500 weight of milk, takes that time, that 1668 average price there. I'm looking at about 25K in milk revenues based off what the market says November milk's going to be worth. But I've also got my feed costs there. I've got my 20 tons of corn. Well, corn's priced in bushels, so I've got to convert that over into tons here. That's my corn cost. There's my meal. That's pretty simple. I'm looking at about 6,500 in feed costs there. The margin just takes the difference between the two. And this is what we're going to you know, look to insure on. Basically here, once I subtract that out, I've got about $18,000 left in a gross margin. Work that out on 100 weight of milk, I'm looking at a margin of about 1230 is what I'm protecting on that milk. Now I took a deductible, remember I took that 50 cent deductible, so I gotta take that off as well. So by the time I'm done, I'm insuring against 1181 on that margin. So again, it's looking at that difference between milk revenues and feed costs. And it protects whether milk moves around or the feed costs move around. A lot of people like to look at it in terms of a, a milk price, which you can, and it, you can look at it this way. Basically, the idea is this. I'm protecting this, and if milk, if, say, feed costs remain the same, then this would pay only on the milk. And it would say any time that prices move 50 cents below where they're at today, I'd get a payment. If the feed costs go up, my payment would be enhanced from that. If my feed costs go down, then my payment would decline a little bit. So there's some interaction here between those two. But milk represents the big portion of what you're looking at in that margin. And this is what you could have insured last month. You can see up here the expected milk price going out Futures were saying we had a little dip here and then start to rise in the springtime. You'll notice that the gross margin you can insure does basically the same thing. And this difference between the two is reflecting those expected feed costs. Here in November, that difference is about $4.30 a bushel, or $4.30 a hundredweight. It tightens up to about $4.15 here and spreads back out to about $4.30 as you look out there. And again, that pattern is the same pattern you see when you look at the futures market. Now the actual prices that we're going to settle this out at, again, come from the same place. We're looking at those futures contracts on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We're still looking at that class three milk. We're still looking at the corn and soybean meal futures for the feed cost. We're still doing a three-day average here, but in this case, that three-day average is when these contracts are going to expire. So we're looking at the same things, just at a different point in time. And we use the same rules where there are holes. If I don't have a futures contract there, we're gonna fill in with the surroundings. And these are the periods of time that we'd be looking at here. So with the milk contracts, those all basically close at the end of the month sometimes spilling over into the next month. And we're always looking at an average, basically, of the three days right before the contract expires. For corn and for soybean meal, that contract expires in the middle of the month. And so that's why you have a little different timing here between the two. That we're looking at right at the end of that contract. What does that say about price levels then? To get the actual gross margin, we do the same thing we did with the expected. We're looking at your milk revenue. We're going to subtract off the feed cost. We're going to plug in those actual price levels now instead of those expected price levels. So let's say this happens. Come November, let's say that milk, oh, we, we, we had a little bit of a loss. If you remember, expected price was $16.68. Let's say she dropped down to 16 bucks. Let's say the corn looking out there, we got up to around 650. And on the soil meal, 320 per ton there. Remember, what I'd put in, I'm insuring 1,500 weight of milk. I had told people I'm going to feed 20 tons of corn, six tons of soybean meal. Those numbers do not change. That's what I put in at the beginning. That's what we use 
coming out at the end. Plug those through. My milk revenue, what am I looking at there? Well, I've got 24K coming in in revenue. So I've seen about $1,000 worth of loss compared to the expected value there. When I look at my feed costs, they came in at about 6,500 again. So the feed didn't move that much. We saw a drop in that milk revenue. So when I look at the actual gross margin, it came out 17,400 or around 1162 on a per hundred weight basis. In this case, since that margin is below what I insured though, I'm gonna get an indemnity. And that indemnity is just gonna look at the difference between my gross margin guarantee, so that 17.7 that I insured in September, in November I got 17.4, I get the difference between the two, so it's gonna pay me about 275 bucks or 18 cents a hundred weight, that difference there. Now going back here, if that milk price had stayed up there around 16.50, I wouldn't have gotten a payment because my gross margin then would have been up here north of 17.7. On the other hand, if my feed cost, say that corn price had shot back up to seven again, my feed cost would have been higher, my margin would have been lower, and I would have gotten an even bigger payment than 275. So it's trying to cover multiple risks. If you're used to talking about futures and options, this is what is called an uh, Asian basket option. It's Asian in that it looks at average prices over a three day window. It's a basket because it's looking at milk, corn, and soybean now. But in this grand scheme, it's an option. When my margin's below the guarantee, I'm gonna get a payment. Now, some of the issues about it though is that when you're looking at this when I first showed it to you you have a 10 month window you can pick from I just walked you through one month the idea is that when we're looking at this though we're gonna sum across all the months that you insure and so what this means is that say November pays off but December was a great month milk prices shot back up again and I don't have a loss that gain I get from December offsets the loss I have in November. It means you may not get paid as much. At the same time, if you're insuring both months, guess what? Your premium also gets reduced because of that fact. And so the idea is we, you know, for your guarantee, we're summing across all those months. For the actual, we sum the same way across those same months. This is a way to reduce the cost of the insurance. So it's not paying off each and every time. And in fact, when I was talking to Ken, he reminded me of a very good point here. For those of you that do crop insurance, having multiple months is sort of like the difference between optional units versus insurance or uh, enterprise units for your crop insurance. With optional units, you get paid off on each one. Enterprise, you're adding them all together and only get paid on the sum. Same thing here. Individual months, like an optional unit, sum them together at your enterprise. And so again, as a producer, you get to choose. Do you want this month by month? Do you want this over multiple months? Where do you need the risk protection as you're looking at there? Because this is what can happen. In this case, looking forward over time, let's say that this was what the guarantees look like. And in this case, this is what they look like in, at the end of September as we looked out there. And you can see, you got a fairly good swing down here, about 25, 30 cents going into early part of spring, and then it kicks back up again. If you insure multiple months, we gotta see what happens on the actuals. And so I just picked some numbers just to show you what could happen and what tends to happen, is that what you'll see is that this thing will pay off in some months and then turn around and not pay off in others. So you'll have some months there where you have a loss. And if you had insured them individually, it's this difference that you would get back as your indemnity. If you're insuring multiple months, though, we've got to add in the gains as well as the losses. And so, for example, if you had just insured these first two months, 
there's a 19 cent loss here on November, there's a 21 cent gain on December. If I had insured the same amount of milk in both, I would not get a payment. If I had only insured half as much milk in December as I did in November, I would get a payment. But it would be reduced by that December part. And so again, when we laid this out, we tried to lay it out where the idea is it's providing multiple types of risk management depending on what you need. Do you need this each and every month or are you looking to protect some sort of basic level over your entire operation over a longer period of time? You can do both of those things with this policy. And this is just to show you the possible indemnity you could see each and every month and how that can swing widely. One of the things as the creator of this policy, I've went back and I've looked back over the past decade to see how this policy would pay out. And what you will find is that it tends to pay out either very large amounts or nothing because of the swings in the market. When we rate this thing, we try to rate it where it's what's called actuarially fair, which means whatever over a long period of time we expect to pay out, that's what you'll get charged as a premium. And in this case, that works very much like what you see with options when you buy them on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, based off the same principle. And so it's reflecting that volatility. Some of the advantages LGM has, though, over traditional options are, one, it's just convenience. The idea is you don't have to set up an account with a broker. You don't have to worry about margin calls, say, if you're doing hedging futures. The idea is that you basically work with your crop insurance agent. You've got 12 months per year that you can sign up. You have multiple opportunities. Get yourself some price risk management out there. It also is very customizable. So in this case, LGM can be tailored to any size farm. When you look at a milk futures or a milk options, there's so much milk you have to be able to have to cover that contract. Here, you don't have to match that contract size. You could insure 100 weight of milk in a month if you wanted to. You can insure 100,000. You can insure anything in between. So the idea is it doesn't have the size restrictions that futures and options have. And the idea is that, especially with options, you know, the idea is that if you tried to do this on your own through the options market, which you could do, the sizes are often such that it won't match what your operation is like. And so this can be tailored specifically to the size of your operation. Also, when you're buying this, you don't have to decide on the mix of options, strike prices, the dates you're going to do this. All that's already built into the program. And so we see this as providing support to both small and large dairy producers in that it can be tailored to both sizes, but they're both getting the same type of guarantee and they're both being charged in exactly the same way. So it's fair to both size operations. Now, how much does it cost? Well, again, I talked about this a little bit before. They're set so it's gonna pay you, or you're gonna pay in basically what we expect to pay out to you over the long haul. In terms of high price volatility, like what we've been seeing, especially over the last couple of months, the premiums do get high. The idea is that this type of insurance, since it's keying off of what's going on in the futures market, react to what's going on there. And when you see big swings in the market, that means the markets are highly volatile. There's a lot of risk in that market. That risk shows up in the insurance premium. It shows up in the options premium when you look at the futures market that way. However, if you insure 10 months together, you can see some savings there because you're allowing us to pool things. That cheapens the product up. Also, you can choose this deductible. That helps reduce the cost of this insurance as well. This is what it would have cost you a few days ago. Say if you'd picked zero deductible here, you wanted the full insurance there. To get that would cost you about 90 cents per hundredweight to insure the full margin. The example I walked you through was 50 cents here. And you would have been charged about 66 cents in order to get that. But you can see here, as you increase that deductible, that cost reduces down quite a bit. So by the time you get out here to $2, 
you're talking about some fairly inexpensive catastrophic insurance out there. And again, since you have this flexibility, you can choose individual months or put all the months together. If you put all the months together with the same milk going in each and every month, it'll probably cost you about 66 cents. This is what my example, 1,500 weight of milk each month. 20 tons of corn each month, six tons of soybean meal each month. But if I'd done each of those months individually, same amounts, same deductible, you can see that early on, it's cheaper to just have that single month. So if I go out to December, a little bit higher, and by the time I get out here in January, it's a break even, but as I look further out, much more expensive to insure the individual month. This is showing you sort of the risk involved, if you will, in these markets the further out you go. The further, the more time allowed for prices to move, the more risk there is involved in that price, the more it's going to cost you to insure. And you see the same thing when you look at the options premium. The further out you look, the higher those premiums are. Same principle here. But the idea is you spread that risk out over time, flattens it out, and you'll notice it's not the average of these individual months. It's lower than that because there's additional cost savings, both you as a premium payer and to the government as the reinsurer in this case. The other thing that changed with LGM within this past year is that the livestock products, for the most part, did not have a subsidy involved with them. Typical crop insurance for your corn, your soybean, your oat, your wheat producers had a subsidy with it. Livestock for dairy did not until last year. And as a developer, I was approached by the national people and they said, can you ask for a subsidy? And I said, okay, sure, we can do that. What type of subsidy would you like? Well, they said, we would like something that's a fairly flat subsidy structure, if you will. And so what we tried to do, and you can see here, it's a table based upon deductibles. And in this case, this column here, think of these, these are percents. So this is 50% down here. We set up a percentage table here to try to create a subsidy that would be the same dollar amount per hundred weight as you look out there. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. And the idea is you can only get this subsidy if you pool the coverage, meaning you should insure two or more months. So going back to this picture, the idea is you're in something like this. You're not picking just one month to insure. The government wanted to set it up where if you want the subsidy, we want to see some additional risk management here on the price side. We want to see multiple months covered. And so we worked with the National Milk Federation and the federal government to figure out a subsidy structure. This was what was put in place. Another change that occurred is when you pay the premium. With crop insurance, you always paid it at the end of the year. With livestock insurance, it was always at the beginning of the policy. We've moved to make it more like crop insurance again, where that premium is paid at the end. And so those two changes made this product very popular last year. Part of it was this subsidy level. Just to show you what that subsidy level meant for my premiums there, so this is that same line I showed you before, how much the premium is for LGM at different deductibles. The red line here is what the producer actually pays now in terms of the subsidy. And you can see that this gap, it it's not, doesn't stay completely the same, but the idea is it stays pretty close throughout the entire range there. Even though the percentages change, that subsidy ends up providing about 16 to 18 cents per hundred weight of subsidy up there. Compared to the milk price, that's about 1% of your market price. So we see it as a very small carrot to buy some risk management protection. And again, as a producer, you influence how much this is by picking your deductible and by picking how many months that you insure. Does LGM make early indemnity payments? This is another question I often get. So if a producer has signed up, and say in my example like I did, I only insured that November but that insurance period ran all the way out to next September. Can I get paid on November earlier than next September? The answer is yes on that point. 
this insurance will pay off once we've run through the month that you've insured your amount. Even if the policy lasts until September, if you've got zeros out there for the rest of the month, that's not going to influence that payment. So we go ahead and pay off there. So anytime the last month that you choose to insure, that's when this will pay off. However, let's say I'd done November and it did March in the same policy. I've got to wait until March, even if November's in the money, because March may offset it. And so it does early indemnities in the sense that as soon as your insured milk has gone through the system, we can figure out what that payment is. Now, what happens if you don't meet your marketing plan? Say, in my case, I, you know, I said 1,500 weight of milk. I only come in with 1,400. Am I in trouble here? The answer is no. That is, we've set up rules, and these sort of work like with crop insurance as well. In the event that I'm short, as long as I got the 75% of what I said I was going to do, this policy treats me as though I had marketed all 100%. It's only in the case when I fall below that, then we'll start to knock the insurance down. And they take a fairly loose interpretation of when this 75% has to be. So let's say that you know I come in, I insured that November, 1,500 weight, 15,000, yeah, 1,500 hundred weight. Let's say I only do 1,000 in November, but then I do another 500 in December. Does that get me through this? The answer is yes. Because when they look at this amount of marketings that are covered, that's over that entire yearly window. That's what they're looking at there. So I can come up short in one month. As long as I make it up in the next month and it's in that insurance period, it counts. So again, we're not going to, it's not ticky tack in this idea that you said 1500 each month, it has to be 1500 each month. No. Could be 1600 one month, 1400 the next. As long as the total, when we're all said and done, is 75% of what you told me it's going to be, we're good to go. And so the idea is with this, it, 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 you know, it is a more complex insurance product than most of the ones we've got out there. In the sense of there's a lot of numbers moving around. At the same time, most of those numbers you get to pick them. There's two really good places to find out additional information. One, right here in Wisconsin, Dr. Brian Gould up here has become, I'll call him the national guru for LGM for dairy. Actually, I work with him quite a bit on this. He's developed a website called Understanding Dairy Markets. Here's the address here. You can click on the LGM Dairy tab. He's built in a lot of these things I've talked about here. He has a premium rater on his website. He has a feed calculator on his website to help you walk through what this policy is and does and how you might want to set it up. I tell people this policy is sort of like when you go back to school and you know, we were teaching a concept in college. Normally, you have to see a concept three times before you really pick it up. And LGM is one of those things where you have to look at it a couple of times and then usually the light bulb goes off, what this is doing for you. What Brian's done, I would argue, is giving you a time and on, you know, whenever you have opportunity and you've got web access, you can grab one of those three times that you need to walk through it. And he's done a great job. And he basically has the latest information on LGM for dairy because I make sure he does. As soon as I send stuff to the federal government, I also send it to Brian so that he can put it online as soon as he possibly can. The other thing I would do is cop to your crop insurance agent. I'm talking to Ken here, I've talked to Ken quite a bit. He's one of the agent, he, you know, and he knows the policy well. What you see is that your crop insurance agents know a heck of a lot about this product. And they're figuring out their own ways of understanding it as well. What I found out about this product is there's probably about six different ways to understand it and each of them work for a different person. So what I'm hoping I've done here today is introduce to you what it is, walk through what it does. Now 
want to see what questions you have for me about it. This is a product that I would say is, you know, I think it's a good risk management product, but it's not for all people. I'm one of the few guys who's in, created a product and will tell you, you know, there's sometimes maybe you just don't want to buy this. At other times, it works fairly well. If you think about what's happened to the dairy industry over the past five years, we've seen tremendous highs and tremendous lows. When we conceived this product, we were trying to, if you will, minimize those lows while allowing you to still enjoy those highs. Whether we pulled that off or not, well, that's up to you. But at least you can evaluate, and especially, like I say, on Brian's site, you can go back and look at what this would have done back in 2008, 2009, and where this would have helped your business and where it wouldn't have helped you. Um, but it takes some time to, to look through. It's not just something you're going to know right away. All right, I'm from Missouri, the show me state. So now show me where I've missed in talking about this product. Yes, sir. First serve, yeah. Okay. It's a, well, b both are fun. And, and for those of you who aren't crop insurance agents in the room, let me explain the first part of his question. With livestock insurance, um, unlike crop insurance, the federal government put a cap on how much it was willing to spend on livestock insurance. Crop can spend all at once. Livestock insurance has to remain within a $20 million cap. And that covers all the types of revenue or of livestock insurance. So for dairy, for swine, for cattle, for lamb, all have to fit within this $20 million cap. Last year, because of the changes we made with LGM for dairy, dairy became incredibly um, popular. And out of that 20 million, dairy took 16. And all the others had to play in four. And that's why LGM for dairy stopped being sold in March. We had burned through all that money by March. Now that $20 million cap is set on a fiscal year basis. And the federal fiscal year starts in October and then runs through next September. That's why we're starting here in October. Beginning of the fiscal year, we got the 20 million again. Now how, well, the, the risk management agency, so the federal government's arm that runs insurance, how will they allocate that 20 million? I don't know. I've got a rumor. Ken gave it to me, but I won't say it here. I won't put him on the spot. But the idea is that they'll spread this money out across dairy, swine, cattle, lamb. Is it possible we run out within the first month or two? Quite definitely. Again, this product has been fairly popular with dairy producers. Also, there are changes with the swine program now that may make that one popular as well. How does that 20 million get changed? Well, it takes an act of Congress. It was Congress that put in the $20 million cap. It's only Congress that can take it away. Will they do that? Not that I know of at this moment. And given if they took it away, it would cost the government money, I wouldn't bet on it. But it could change. Because you know, I guess when I hear especially um, those on the Senate and House Agriculture Committees talking, they're talking about safety net features. Well, risk management, crop insurance, livestock insurance, that's a safety net issue. So we may see them loosen it up, but it's only Congress that controls that piece of it. And until that cap is loosened, I would argue 
yeah, we would love to offer it more times. You know, as you mentioned here, it's only offered at the end of each month. If we went to every, you know, every two weeks, well, we would run through that money that much more quickly. I think the other thing here too is in, in the way this is structured, um, give you a brief history lesson on LGM. This wasn't for the dairy, but when we first started out with the hogs on the swine side, we used to sell it on a more frequent basis and we had a longer window for it. So when you sign up for dairy today, at the end of the month on the last business Friday, that's when they can start selling and then to the next Saturday, you know, basically for about a day and a half is the window for this each month. Back when we first started, it was a two week window. Well, what producers would do is they'd wait till the end of that two week window, knowing that the prices were set at the front end, see which where prices were moving. If they were in the money, they signed up. If they were out of the money, they didn't. And so in response to that, we had to shorten the window up and shorten the number of periods that we offer this insurance. So you're not likely to see that change anytime soon. But in order to get those changes through, I'm the guy you need to talk to because I'm the guy who helps run the program. And so, like I said, with dairy, with the premium subsidy, with the timing of the premium, we worked with National Milk, we worked with RMA to get that done. And so, we still have the flexibility to change the product if it's beneficial. But at the same time, there are things that we cannot change, like the $20 million cap. Do you have a question, sir? Yes, you can. The question was, can you have multiple policies out basically at the same time? And yes, you can, because each one is handled separately. The only restriction is, is that over the course of an entire year, you're only allowed to insure so much milk. And Ken, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the total is 240,000 hundred weight of milk. As long as you haven't hit that big total, you're allowed to have multiple uh, policies open at the same time. So for example, I could have started in July insuring December milk. And I could put, you know, a thousand hundred weight in December in July, do it again in August, do it again in September. As long as I have that much milk available, yeah, I can have multiple policies open at the same time. That is not, you know, that is definitely allowed under the policy. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, one of the things, like I say, you know, I know on Brian's site, and I'm flipping back to that there, um, he's got basically a spreadsheet up there that does this calculation already uh, to help walk producers through, okay, what are you feeding? How does that translate into corn and soybean meal amounts? At the same time, as, as I said here, these things are suggested. The idea is that producer can actually put these at almost whatever level that they want. What I often tell producers is, is that it depends on two things to me, where you want to set these amounts. One is how much feed do you produce on your own versus how much are you buying. The more I produce on my own, the more likely I am to reduce the feed pr amounts that I put in. This. The other deal is how much feed price risk do you want to build in. For example, I know I've talked to some producers in Arizona where they're highly concerned more about their feed costs than they are about the milk price. And so what they tend to do out there is maximize the amount of corn and soybean meal that they can insure. Actually, the amount they're feeding is less than what they're insuring, but that's what they're worried about is feed cost risk. And so the way they get more of that covered is they increase that amount. Um, with what Brian's done on his site, it allows producers to, to work through those issues. But as far as, I guess, a course teaching it, um, I haven't seen one developed. In my case, I am uh, legally restricted from doing that. Um, but Brian can do all he wants. And so that's why I've been most supportive in trying to get him the information so that he can help instruct producers on how to use this. And like I say, his website is a 
is a great tool because he's done these, he's done looking forward on the milk revenues, what sort of break evens you might have here. And so that's one of the biggest things I know I, I've, I've heard from producers is they like to line up this gross margin versus what they consider their break even prices are and try to make sure that they set these margins with the deductibles in to cover those break evens. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is agent compensation included in the premium? No, it is not. Okay, in this case, this is the same thing that is true in crop insurance. Um, when you look at the premium that is charged for that product, it is what's called the actuarially fair premium, which is again, what I expect to pay you is what we're going to charge you for it. Um, that's crop, that's livestock, it all works that way. Uh, in this case, the agent commissions and actually my commission because I get paid to, I get paid to create this product, is set by a formula. So in terms of mine, for example, I am paid either $200 per policy or 1.67% of premium. But that amount is not charged into the premium level that you would see charged to a farmer. For your crop insurance agents, well, uh, there's two types of compensation to the companies. I shouldn't say to the agents, to the companies. The companies receive what's called administrative operating expenses. The formula is set by uh, what's called the standard reinsurance agreement. So there's an agreement between the companies and the government. And depending on the policy, it varies between 18 and 22%. Again, that's not factored into the premium level, but it is based upon premium. The companies also share risk with the government. They can either receive money if crop insurance doesn't pay out, or they may have to pay out money if crop insurance faces large losses. And so that's, a, that's how those are set, but no, they're not built into the premium level that a, a producer faces. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. From last year. None of that's been paid in yet. Well, in the grand scheme of things, it could, but it's coming in after the fact. And it's the way crop insurance has run for as long as it's been around. Well, in this case, that, that, that premium that's paid in goes into the companies. The companies pay part of that up to the federal government. You can think of that payment to the federal government as covering some or all of that $16 million that they have to spend out. The $16 million that I talk about with the federal government is just what the federal government sees it's going to pay out in terms of premium subsidies and this uh, administrative and operating expenses to the insurance company. Do they necessarily compare the two and make sure that they're breaking even at the federal government? No, they don't. And they never have with crop insurance either. In this case, the federal government sees this as, again, risk management. Think of this like a farm bill program. They're willing to spend some here to help producers get some risk management tools underneath them. In the case of the timing, it used to be that, you know, the, you know, in the case of LGM Dairy before last year, you paid up front, now you're paying at the back. The government's out, maybe a little interest in between. Otherwise, it works exactly the same way as it did before. Does that get at part of your question? Well, the, he got, yeah, he got the market. Well, in this case, this is the same thing works in crop. If you don't pay up, you can't sign up again. And so, you, you know, I guess I would say a lot of crop producers, they don't want to burn that bridge. And so they're willing to pay. The difference here is probably the sheer size for some of these 
producers. It, you know, in this case, this type of insurance is fairly expensive, but it's covering a lot of price risk as well. All right, any other questions? If not, I do want to thank you for your time. I'm also rooting for both the Brewers and the Cardinals tonight, so <laughs> don't hold that against me. And so I want to turn it back over to Ken. Thanks a lot. Well, we'd like to thank Dr. Chad Hart for coming uh, from Ames all the way up here to uh, present this presentation. Uh, it was sponsored by Badgerland Financial. We would also encourage each of you to fill out an evaluation form and drop it at the, uh, uh, at the back of the room when you leave. And again, thank you for your attention. We hope you enjoy the uh, 2011 World Dairy Expo. Thank you.